this is an anthology uh, of anthologies as, uh, as such. Uh, and it's, um, it's a talk, but a, a, a written piece. I'll occasionally digress uh, from it. Uh, and uh, I just wrote it uh, for a, a book that's a follow-up uh, to, I guess, the, uh, the last anthology uh, that I did, uh, which th was the third volume of uh, a series of big books uh, called Poems for the Millennium. Uh, the first two uh, were really about the 20th century, and you know, particularly the avant-garde uh, in uh, the 20th century, so modernism and postmodernism. And those were published by, uh, well, they were all published by the University of California uh, a press, so it, it's got the imprimatur, you know, of, a, of an official, uh, you know, but they're not, uh, they're not designed to be, uh, you know, canonical and freeze things. Uh, the first two were, were, were modernism early and uh, postmodernism uh, later, and the third volume, uh, which I uh, co-edited, co-wrote with uh, uh, Jeffrey Robinson, was uh, pushed back into the uh, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th, and, and through the 19th century uh, as a kind of uh, uh, assemblage of uh, uh, romanticism and what we call uh, post-romanticism, so romanticism, post-romanticism, and, and seeing romanticism as part of uh, you know, what leads into uh, uh, modernism. Uh, as we understand it. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the course of doing the big books, as I will point out here, uh, you know, I was also, uh, of course, engaged in, in, in writing my own poetry and performing and, you know, and so on. Uh, as a sequel to uh, 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 volume four of poem, uh, volume three of Poems for the Millennium, uh, Jeffrey co-edited with uh, Julie Carr uh, uh, a collection of uh, essays called Active Romanticism, but specifically designed as a follow-up uh, to uh, the uh, Our Romantics uh, anthology, Active uh, Romanticism. <clears throat> so I'll just go into this. Uh, I call it uh, uh, Reconfiguring uh, Romanticism the fancy uh, as duende and capriccio. And I thought the fancy is, uh, uh, there was a time when uh, the word fancy and the word imagination, uh, you know, meant pretty much the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, well, as I'll be pointing out here also, uh, uh, Coleridge made a division, uh, you know, and imagination was the shaping creative force, you know, and the fancy was, uh, you know, was secondary. Uh, uh, dear Jeffrey Robinson has called this into question, and you know, I, I do uh, also. So reconfiguring romanticism, the fancy as duende, Lorca's term, and capriccio, uh, Goya's term. So in the course of assembling poems for the millennium, volume three, I was engaged in two, at least two, companion works. This wasn't at all strange, but fit maybe too neatly into a view that I like to put forward that the composition of large structures like the Millennium Volumes is inseparable from my other activities as a poet, and that this would hold true for other poets engaged in uh, what Robert Duncan, I believe it was, spoke as a construction of a grand collage and as a poetry of all poetries a type of work practiced in one form or another by many a modern or postmodern poet. <laughs> Looking back at my earlier works, the first of the anthologies, assemblages, Technicians of the Sacred in uh, 1968, um, the uh, Technicians was paralleled by first experiments on my part with total translation as a form of composition from oral sources but also the beginnings of Poland 1931 as an exploration I wrote of ancestral sources of my own in a world of Jewish mystics, thieves, and madmen. Uh, Technicians of the Sacred was a, a world anthology of uh, what at that point had been called 
uh, primitive, uh, primitive and archaic poetry. Uh, and so I began that with uh, you know, the, the statement, uh, primitive means complex. Uh, the follow-up, Shaking the Pumpkin, the Indian book, an anthology of American Indian texts, was also a catalyst for uh, my own a Seneca journal, uh, written while we were living at the Allegheny Seneca Reservation in western New York, uh, while a big Jewish book in 1977 uh, continued the work of Poland in 1931 and led to first experiments with gematria, a kind of traditional numerological poetry, and other forms of traditional aleatory or chance procedures of composition. Uh, in the same vein, I wouldn't separate the book Revolution of the Word, which is an anthology of uh, uh, poets, American poets, uh, between the two world wars. I, I wouldn't uh, separate Revolution of the Word uh, as its American counterpart from that Dada strain, another book of mine, both celebrations of our Dada and modernist predecessors. Romanticism, as Jeffrey Robinson and I came at it, was a catalyst for us as well, much as it was for those who came before us. In Robinson's case, though his primary life's work has been as a devoted and innovative scholar of British Romanticism, he has accompanied the scholarship as such with an ongoing series of original poetry texts drawn or collaged, that he uses the word spliced, uh, from the work of poets, both romantics and moderns, postmoderns, who were central to his studies and enthusiasms. For myself, what I had to overcome was my own prejudice against fixed forms shared with many in my generation in order to see anew the challenges to form and content that was set in motion by the romantics and a number of others who had preceded them. As a matter of nomenclature, Jeffrey and I began to talk between us about experimental romanticism, avant-garde romanticism, although I'm not sure if that phrase came into the actual writing. With that as our target, experiment and transformation appeared both in aspects of romantic writing that were largely subterranean and even more surprisingly, I thought, at the heart and core of the romantic project. An aspect of this, from my side at least, was that the romantics and those we call the post-romantics began to feel like contemporaries, less magisterial figures and more like fellow poets with whom we could enter into a free and easy discourse. You know, Goethe, it's a little difficult <laughs> to do that, but it can be done. Uh, in large part, if this doesn't sound too arcane or abstract, we wrote on Jeffrey Robinson's recovery of the fancy, salvaging it from Coleridge's otherwise brilliant and long-lived dichotomy of fancy and imagination. The two terms, fancy and imagination, had otherwise been historically synonymous, whereas Coleridge made imagination not just his shaping spirit, but a binding spirit that reconciled and thereby froze deep conflicts of image and idea. In relation to this, the fancy appeared as a secondary or degraded or trivialized faculty, an arena of mere image making and escape rather than a liberating force for play and invention, the field par excellence of the experimental and visionary. In this sense, I would think of imag imagination, qua fancy as fancy, less in Coleridge's sense as reconciliation and closure then in Keats's definition of negative capability, followed immediately by his, Keats's criticism of Coleridge, quote, uh, several things dovetailed in my mind and it once struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in, lit in literature and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously I mean negative capability, that is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without an irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery from being incapable of remaining content with half-knowledge. Or Whitman, in an equally famous passage, 
do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. That being said, I would as well speak of imagination as a fancy, the good of it being always in the meanings, not in the nomenclature, an acknowledgement in any case of their fluidity, both before and after Coleridge, with the invocation of the one often sliding curiously into an invocation of the other. Uh, Whitman's farewell poem is called Goodbye My Fancy, not Goodbye My Imagination, mm -hmm. Goodbye My Fancy. Uh, I thought of all this again in the process of working through a series of poems that I was composing alongside the major work of construction or assemblage that Robinson and I were engaged in. The series in question, 50 poems in all, was my response to Goya's uh, Caprichos, uh, uh, wonderful series of etch uh, prints, graphic work, uh, uh, fantastical, both as a touchstone of an emerging romanticism, the Caprichos, uh, and as a forerunner of the expressionist and surrealist side of a modernism yet to be. The images that Goya gave me helped, as with other forms of ekphrastic writing, as of uh, uh, writing uh, as a response to, uh, to visual images, to paintings and sculpture and such. Um, the images that uh, Goya gave me helped, as with other forms of ekphrastic writing, to launch a succession of my own images and fancies, an interaction across space and time that I've often tried to practice. In the opening poem, for example, I begin with Goya's well-known self-portrait, a figure slumped over a table on which are written the words, El sueño de la razón produce monstruos. The sleep or dream of reason produces monsters. From that and from the bats and owls that fly around him comes the following, not a literal account of Goya's image, but a journey into places where the fancy leads me on my own. His is a world where owls live in palm trees where a shadow in the sky is like a magpie. White and black are colors only in the mind. The cat you didn't murder springs to life, a whistle whirling in a cup, gone and foregone, a chasm bright with eyes. There is a cave in Spain, a fecal underworld where bats are swarming among bulls, the blackness ending in a wall his hands rub up against, a blind man in a painted world, a mock and monstrous banging on a rock. In the course of which I became aware, as I should have earlier, that caprichos as a term was most commonly translated as fancy or fancies, which after Coleridge at least would effectively conceal what Goya was unleashing here. Yet it is precisely in his caprichos that Goya shows us the fancy as a power, not a work, a struggle, not a thought, as Federico García Lorca wrote of that related or perhaps identical power he called duende. In Lorca's case, too, the word in question went back to an earlier source that belied the characteristics that he ascribed to it, a hobgoblin or imp to start with, and a driving force among those flamenco singers and dancers from whom he took it. Dramatized by Lorca as engaged in a fierce creative struggle, chthonic, earthbound, even demonic in his telling, it also released, as he described it, a sense of unprecedented formal and visionary transformations. Quote, the Duende's arrival always means a radical change in forms. It brings to old plains unknown feelings of freshness with the quality of something newly created like a miracle, and it produces an almost religious enthusiasm. It is this force, or something very close to it, that Jeffrey Robinson captures in his aforementioned description of fancy, with perhaps a greater emphasis on the transformative or experimental side of the process, as well as the playfulness of the original folk presences that in no way diminishes the power of what's at work or play here. The search on this side of romanticism is less toward resolution then and more toward struggle and conflict with a resultant liberatory 
thrust, the adjective is Robinson's, uh, newfound openness of form and thought. In the process, Goya's caprichos operate at white heat, burning away appearances to let new worlds emerge. Kept hidden otherwise by mind-forged manacles, in Blake's words, and inherited conventions of the really real. For me, at least, the convergence of Blake and Goya is essential to their time and to the times that lead from them to us. Having plunged into a new series of poems, 50 Caprichos After Goya, just as Poems for the Millennium, the third Romanticism volume, was getting underway, and with Black's, Blake's sense of the fancy and Lorca's duende always in mind, I moved toward the following concluding poem in my terms and I hope in theirs. Coda to 50 Caprichos with duendes. Duendes sound a last hurrah. They squeeze a bellows, scrub a dish with greasy hands, a whisper in an ear bent down to listen. No one sees them. Over every duende falls the shadow of a greater duende. Holy moly, is this not a black sound, Mr. Lorca? Pissing olive oil, I isn't what I seems to be. A poor partaker, barrel overturned, the wine, eyes swigs, gone rancid. There is now an end to everything. What is flesh, they suck no more. They drive the foul caprichos out of sight. Caprichos, Goya, Lorca, all my duendes, locked into a cage at dawn, evading sleep and dreams, those whom they leave behind them, fathers raising arms to heaven, screaming through their empty mouths like caverns, black holes, where all light is lost. Now is the time. If this, then, was my interplay with Goya and Lorca, the discourse and engagement with Romanticism was linking deliberately on my part with still other aspects of the poetry I was then composing. At the turning of the century and the millennium, I had written and published a long series of poems, a hundred poems, a, a book of witness in 2001, in which I explored, among other matters, the first person voice as integral to the poetic act of witnessing, even of prophecy, itself an inheritance from Romanticism, by the poet directly or with the poet as a conduit for others. I mean here a first person that isn't restricted to familiar confessional stances, but is the instrument in language for all acts of witnessing the key with which, like Keats's chameleon poet, we open up to voices other than our own. There was in all of this a question of inventing and reinventing identity, of experimenting with the ways in which we can speak or write as I. In the course of putting that identity into question, I brought in occasional <clears throat> and very brief first-person statements by other contemporary poets, very lightly sometimes, but as a further way of playing down the merely ego side of I. The continuity with the first two volumes, modern and postmodern, of Poems for the Millennium seems to me obvious, no less the relation to romantic poetics, as in the case of Keats and others, <coughs> which I had still more fully to explore. Shortly before Jeffrey Robinson and I started on our romantics project, <coughs> I was beginning a new series of poems, fancies perhaps in the sense of Blake and Goya, in which the operative thrust was to suppress the I as it had emerged in a book of witness, and to let world and mind interact absent direct first person intervention. So book of witness, I, ego, uh, book of concealments, I concealed but still there. <laughs> Jackson McLeod, too, is uh, like John Cage into uh, uh, chance poetry for your procedures. Says that 
ego never got. <laughs> the title I gave it, A Book of Concealments, was drawn from a medieval Jewish work, Sifre de Sentia Uta, from which <clears throat> I also drew, as with a book of witness, occasional and very brief statements or phrases, but without further citation. The idea of concealment, in contrast to that of witness, had many implications and was a driving force behind the work as such. Not least, of course, was the concealment of the singular first person pronoun, as if that in itself might counter what Keats had called the egotistical sublime, or Charles Olson, the lyrical interference of the individual as ego, a challenging, if imperious, directive in the first place. Midway through the work and with Poems for the Millennium, Volume 3, already underway, I dedicated a poem to uh, Michael McClure, uh, who's generally associated with the, uh, with, with the beat poets, but always that's a, um, uh, sometimes undefined, well, no, Michael was close enough. Uh, so, <clears throat> midway through the work and with Poems for the Millennium, Volume 3, already underway, I dedicated a poem to Michael McClure, with whom I had an ongoing discourse about romanticism and romantics as those entered into the poetry and poetics of our own time. The poem's title, A Deep Romantic Chasm, was drawn from Coleridge's seminal and truly fanciful Kubla Khan. Uh, the title led me to consider using the romantic poets in millennium as I had used the modern and postmodern poets in a book of witness and to break down in other ways the barrier between the poems and concealments and the large assemblage I was simultaneously composing. <laughs> in the process, I separated a group of poems under the title Romantic Dadas and had those published as a limited edition artist book, but all remained integral to a book of concealments and were included as such in the final publication. The result is that the last third of the book, 25 or 30 poems, has a score of such insertions uh, as in the following, uh, with the Baudelaire appropriation noted in the margin and a short sentence from an earlier poem of mine set likewise in italics, which you cannot see. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Baudelaire, I, I think from uh, uh, Keith Waldrop's recent translation of, uh, uh, of Baudelaire, so not, not particularly familiar sounding. Involuntary dr tears, a dream of executions, smoke rises between our teeth. Concealed assassins. Those who are masters needn't talk, but signal with a secret nod or wink Concealed assassins brought into the mix. Involuntary tears, a dream of execution, smoke rises between our teeth. The ones who loved us die, not one by one, but now en masse. The presence of the dead in every corner. The wretch who testifies may also sing capturing the ebb and flow of tides, the pressure blood breeds where it stokes the body, wants to stand there, hapless, to sense the joy in failure only the wise can know. Someone will lift a burden from our eyes, and we will witness worlds unseen. <clears throat> Looking back now, I can only surmise that the work of assemblage and that of original composition were, for me at least, deeply codependent. Certainly the poems in both Concealments and Caprichos, later published as a single book, would have been different were I not engaged then in the construction of Poems for the Millennium. <clears throat> By the same token, I needed just that sort of engagement to feel myself in an active exchange with those poets whom Jeffrey Robinson and I were weaving into our larger composition. It is something like this that I found years ago in Pound's construction of an active anthology, and the use of the word active in the title of the present volume again brings that thrust to mind. Whatever it is that goes to create a canon, a word and concept we could well do without religious terminology, 
or to perpetuate it through a canonical anthology or series of such, an active and thereby transformative idea of anthology as of our lives in general is by far the greater work to aim at. The fancy as capriccio and duende demands nothing less of us. An addendum to the proceeding. In the years since Poems for the Millennium, I've engaged in two other big projects. A 600-page reader of my own work uh, in various genres that I structured in a manner similar to the Millennium volumes, and an ongoing assemblage of outside and subterranean poetry from the Paleolithic caves of Europe to the work of poets and other language artists in the near present. With the reader called the Eye of Witness, I became engaged or re-engaged with my own past works. And as I got into those, I began a smaller book of variations using poems of mine from a half century earlier to supply me with nouns that I wove together in a way that I had previously done with translations of Lorca and other poets. There's a, a book of mine called The Lorca Variations. And uh, that's uh, after I translated a, uh, uh, a book by Lorca written early and never published in his lifetime, uh, called Sweets, the, the musical term, Sweets. Uh, and uh, when I found that um, Forrest Strauss, as the publisher, went back on a promise to publish you know, each of the elements in uh, uh, the, their collected translations of Lorca, uh, they had, there was a promise to uh, you know, to publish the suites as a separate volume, and they, they went back on that. So I went back to the suites, you know, and uh, going suite by suite. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, worked out a system for using all of uh, uh, Lorca's nouns in my English uh, uh, translations and uh, uh, reconstructing poems uh, out of that. So that's, that's what I'm referring to kind of variations. Uh, to bolster myself here, and as a lead-in to some of the new work, I twice quoted Henri Matisse on the need to rewrite or to reimagine <coughs> one's own work in the course of a lifetime. The first was from a letter to the Italian painter Gino Severini. Quote, one should be able to rework an old work at least once to make sure that one has not fallen victim to one's nerves or to fate. And the second, also to Severini, when you have achieved what you want in a certain area, when you have exploited the possibilities that lie in one direction, you must, when the time comes, change course, search for something new. What followed, to give you an idea of it, were variations on a work published in 1962, uh, The Seven Hells of the Jigoku Zoshi, where I went poem by poem through the seven, really eight poems that made up the series. And for each one, I made a kind of auto variation, self variation. So here anyway is the second hell of thieves uh, and my variation thereon from 50 years later. It, it, it's, it's really, let me say, in a, in a way, with all the dangers involved, it's really quite wonderful to have 50 years of, uh, of, of retrospection avail available to you. You know, I, I know what the drawbacks are in that, but, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's curious. <laughs> the second hell of thieves from 1962 where thieves are ground in waters. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. The shore is washed by the sea, the sea is combed by the wind, the wind sleeps all day in the chimney, it moves through the house in the evening, it wakes us, it opens a door for the sea, it walks where the thieves walked, it leads us into a night without windows. Comfort me, stay with me, light of my eyes, the lovely thieves are no more. 
The thieves are crying, their voices are crying from hell. Their tears fill the snow with lost coins. Their tears burn my fingers, my fingers that move through your hair. How gentle your voice is. Respond to them, answer them. Think of the pain they bear in their skin, the thread that runs from their skin to your voice, from your voice to the wind. Respond to them, answer them. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. The shadows are silent. The silence has entered your voice. Your voice is asleep in the shadows. Wake again in the night. Wake again full of fear. Wake to the shadow of death at your window. The ladders that hung from the sky are falling. The thieves are falling. Their blood is filling the earth. The earth that awaits you. The earth that destroys you. The earth that has stolen your voice. The earth's voice is crying with hunger. A single grave waits for us all. A single stone grinds us to water. The water flows to the sea. The sea is asleep in your voice, your voice that could flood hell with tears, that could ease the pain of the dying. But only the thieves cry tonight. They cry where no one can hear them. Their voices cry from the stone. Their voices cry where we sleep without dreams. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. Variations on the hell of thieves. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. When a wind blows in from the sea, a door swings open and light, white as hell, nearly blinds us. Night begins later, the skin on my fingers flakes off. A rank wind shakes the ladders we climb on. The earth more distant for which we still hunger, the sea filling up with our tears, our voices lost in the wind. Thieves who scour our shores at evening, whose voices sound under our windows, whose tears hide our pain, cry out with one voice past shadows and windows, one voice for earth and one voice for water. And thieves dressed like thieves, a hell like no other, a house overlooking the sea on a night when coins ring and death has a voice like a thieves' voice. Earth returning to earth, then to water, a voice. Thieves dissemble in dreams. Thieves and a sea and a chimney down which thieves clamber. More thieves in the snow, skin and hair growing white. A shadow that thieves spill like blood, like the voice from a stone, the voice of the dying. Thieves and voices, shore, wind and sea, Tears and eyes, fingers spinning a thread in fear of the sky and the earth of thieves lost at sea, a grave and a stone left for thieves where thieves vanish. The next big book, now complete and awaiting publication, is called Barbaric, Vast, and Wild. The title from great 18th century enlightenment writer and encyclopedist, which is a kind of anthology, uh, about the origins and uh, function uh, of, of poetry, barbaric, vast, and wild. Uh, poetry must have something in it, Diderot wrote, that is barbaric, vast, and wild. For me, too, it's a culmination of the project I began with Technicians of the Sacred, to assemble a wide-ranging gathering of poems and related language works whose outside, outsider positions can extend the field in which poetry has been or may be practiced, as well as the form and substance of the poetry itself. It also extends the time frame of the preceding volumes in Poems for the Millennium, hoping to show that in all places and times, what the dominant culture has taken as poetry has only been part of the story. That work may be done by now or may still be in progress, but while it goes on, the seepage from the grand assemblage flows into the substance of the poems I'm continuing to write in tandem, or I hope so. So what I'll do to bring this presentation to a close is to end it with two recently written poems in which voices from the outside and subterranean sources combine with what is otherwise the natural content of the works at hand. And uh, uh, was, the, was that coda from uh, Further Witness uh, printed? Uh? Yes, I don't think 
Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I, I won't... I won't end with that. Mm. I could. Well, I'll bring it in. <coughs> Yeah, last, uh, last year, uh, uh, an old friend, uh, American poet, uh, uh, born in Finland, whose first languages were Finnish and German, uh, Anselm Hollow, uh, passed away. Uh, and uh, I began a, a, a poem during his, uh, uh, during his illness, uh, last illness, uh, and uh, finished it uh, uh, the day he died. Uh, and um, in uh, Barbaric, Vast, and Wild, we were including uh, some work by the, uh, the you know, so-called pre-Socratic uh, philosopher, but really poet, uh, Empedocles. Um, and, and a point to, to be made in that Greek world where uh, uh, Plato virtually outlaws poetry, uh, <clears throat> that his predecessors, uh, uh, Empedocles, Parmenides, and others were great poets. Uh, now, I, I don't think he's going after them. He is going after Homer with regrets, but uh, um, anyway, this is from a, um, uh, a passage in uh, 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 Empedocles ex exists now in fragments, uh, and the fragments are thought to belong to two major works of his. And this is from a work that, uh, you know, after his time, it's, it's called On Nature. And um, he's presumably addressing a, uh, an acolyte a follower, uh, one Pausanias, translated by Stanley Lombardo. Press these things into the pit of your stomach as you meditate with pure and compassionate mind, and they will be with you the rest of your life, and from them much more, for they grow of themselves into the essence, into the core of each person's being. But if your appetite is for all those other things that generate suffering and blunt human minds, these powers will leave you in the turning of time and out of love for their own return to the source. For this you must know. All things possess intelligence and a share of thought. So the poem for Anselm begins, <clears throat> Empedocles of Acragas. All things possess intelligence and a share of thought. Three parts. One, I who am dead call to the living. Little brothers, how absurd your walk is, unencumbered and adrift. You run across life's stage, your words are manacles, and cage your mind. I know enough of you to sense your pain freely and fiercely. I move into a deeper space where none will reach me. Here I strike a blow, an imbeciling fluid from inside my body covers the ground between and blocks all entry. Birds like little knives dive down the sky, le mal de ciel, a phrase I hear and fly from. Two, reduced to bits of light, a thin white line, nerves end or eyes eclipse. It sticks inside my throat. I try but cannot cough it out. The edges of a tongue sharper than nails leave me numb and distant from my own recall of pain. The pattern of small trees that block my path, a flash of lights back of my eyes, twitter and call of birds made out of air, the fragile bones my fingers crack and weave like wires, blood aghast flows in a line, so thin it fades from sight, tick tock the clock inside your heart, a tremble, night will overcome the sleepers, we will raise a sheet and watch them as they fall like phantoms down a thousand worlds. Three, my word for it is not enough. It takes a certain force, 
the mystery of mind spread through the universe, alive in each of us, our thoughts returning to the source, uncharted, absent, each time another friend departs, my breath feels distant, days condense to minutes, nights to days, the mystery is in the words alone, he writes. The rest he cannot know, but bears it in his mind. All things possess intelligence and a share of thought. Now, at the end, there is again a, a coda. And again, I address it to Diane. Uh, and it begins here with a, uh, a, another work that appears in uh, Barbaric, Vast and Wild from Japanese uh, uh, poet uh, Ikkyu, writing something to leave behind is yet another kind of dream. When I awake, I know there will be no one left to read it. Immersed in light, the final blindness seals him shut, his body crammed into a moving car, the future and the past colliding, blown apart. I sign the final email. Who the others are unknown to me, the corners of my mind are dark now, like the universe itself, unspoken, dropping from my hand. The book is not a ball of light, the pain I feel in leaving cannot be your pain. Another kind of dream invades me. Loving you, the way ahead, the far side of a wall arises, newly built, a further witness beckons in the name of love as powerful as this. The present tense is all we have. I count the days with you, our fingers join and come apart. Again, we live on borrowed time. Words left behind, the book inside my dream, too bright for those to whom we write or speak. And know when we awake, there will be no one left to read it. Is, uh, I still have to figure out how to read it. It's from a series of poems called Divigations. Um, and um, I, I can't see all the way in the back, but uh, it's set up with a poem in, in larger print. Uh, and then on the, on the side, a series of alternative words. Uh, and this is a kind of um, as some of you will know, uh, homage uh, to Emily Dickinson, uh, you know, who left in the fascicles, uh, she, she used little plus marks or crosses uh, to give alternative uh, <coughs> words. So I've got those words in there and I'll try to make my voice correspond to the uh, <laughs> introduction of the alternative uh, words. <coughs> And uh, this, this ends uh, with um, uh, reference to uh, um, Persian writer, uh, Mansur al-Halaj. I should have read that last night for the Iranian visitors, uh, ex except he came to a bad, <laughs> bad end uh, because, well, he wrote, I am he who I love, and he whom I love is I. We are two spirits dwelling in one body. If thou seest me, thou seest him, and if thou seest him, thou seest us both. And it was for identifying himself with the god, uh, that he was tortured and executed in, 19, in 922 at the orders of the Abbasid Caliph uh, al-Muqtadir.
But Rumi wrote of him, when Halaja's love for God reached its utmost limit, he became his own enemy and he gnawed himself. He said, I am the real, that is, I have been eliminated. The real remains, nothing else. This is extreme humility and the utmost limit of servanthood. It means he alone is. To make a false claim and to be proud to is to say, you are God and I am the servant. In this way, you are affirming your own existence and duality is a necessary result. If you say, he is the real, that too is duality, for there cannot be a he without an I. Hence the real said, I am the real. Other than he, nothing else existed. Halaj had been annihilated. So these were the words of the real. You know, unfortunately, Halaj was also <laughs> annihilated. Um, Divigations 25, <clears throat> harbingers uh, of days to come. For Halaj, wait, wait, wait till the ending of the poem. Among forgotten words, worlds, the passage vanishes, erased, misplaced. My head between my legs, my body severed, cut from trunk to toes. Suppose the light inside this room, this tomb, were further darkness, the shadows on this wall in this hall were harbingers of days to come. The time is nearly nigh to make a last fast, a fast farewell. The future clearly now behind me, every day as dark as every night. A marker in the mind more real than what the hand feels or the eye sees. The word imaginary leaps, seeps out from the page, the stage, becomes a thing more than a thought. The world, the word, because it never was, will never be the signs of which we learn to track yet fall behind and waver. Smoke no more is holy, spuds and buds won't feed the soul. The price of pain of rain is more pain, rain. Canyons overflow a city once so proud is subject to the winds of change. The waves that lick our shores are signals of a strange dark tomorrow. Recollection steadies us but falters in its final stage, its final page, and casts us out. In the killer's mind, the sky is overcast, the stars are darkened, the glory of the king is in the sky. Why have you tricked me, someone cries, and falls, crawls across the bed. His mother can't recall his name, the shame he brings her, waiting for the year, the years, to end the voices blending into silence. The draft of violence that draws extinction in, repeated twice, thrice. The figure, fire in the eye, the mind imploding. No counting of the years can quiet them or us. The alphabet stands for a foreign tongue, the speech forgotten, broken. In the days to come, let me step forward with the rest here where the shadow of a child is still alive. In me, let's loose a final cry. I walk along forbidden streets and speak as who I am a stranger to myself, to you, surprised to find me here. Shallow or deep, the words swirl in the tiny pond, no inch of me concealed, revealed. I am the real. Once spoken, drives the speaker to his death, unheard, unmarked, unkempt, unsteady, unbelieved, unequal, unadored, unsung, unsullied, unalive. Each one who writes is martyr to the words he speaks, he seeks, time after time, rhyme after rhyme. So that would be the presentation. Uh, 
Well, <clears throat> sometimes I, <clears throat> I have been commissioned to make a translation. That doesn't maybe count, although it can have interesting results. Um, overall, I think I like to translate uh, because it's a way that I can get closest to poets that uh, you know that have a, a special meaning for me. I also at one time used to translate English poets, but uh, you know just you know, to put them into a somewhat d different uh, language. But you know certainly with poets from you know from who speak in other tongues, um, so the the process of translation is a, is a uh, you know working with the poet. Uh, whether alive or dead, with a live poet, I mean, of course, you can also enter into a, a, a discourse about the poetry. Or when I'm translated into another language, uh, you know, they can, you know, they can do the same uh, with uh, with me. Uh, sometimes there, there are translations that are, uh, uh, you know, a, a real, you know, challenge to the possibility of uh, of, of translation. Uh, you know, so with what, uh, you know. Some years ago, I began to call total translation, uh, which I gave one example at uh, the end of the reading uh, last night. Uh, it was a question uh, uh, with uh, something like traditional American Indian poetry. Um, the, the poems consisted often of uh, both words, uh, you know, and untranslatable sounds, word-like sounds, but not words. Uh, you know, so it was, uh, in our avant-garde terms, a kind of sound poetry uh, in, uh, in, in the songs. Uh, very often in um, conventional translations, uh, you know, by anthropologists and others, uh, you would get, uh, you know, words translated, uh, you know, and then uh, in, sometimes in parenthesis, um, you know, uh, here, uh, untranslatable sounds on here, nonsense syllables, or um, you know, but they, they, they would never do the, the, the poems in full. It was always uh, 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 partial translation, you know, and, and certainly the music was, uh, you know, was not attended to. And the, the music was my own, mm, you know, misconception or trick, uh, you know, at the end. I, I first in, uh, uh, oh, I have it here, in, in Shaking the Pumpkin, uh, Uh, used this as a way of uh, translating uh, Seneca Indian songs with very few words. Uh, so to show a, a resemblance to the minimal poetry of our own time, uh, which was what was then being called concrete poetry. Uh, with Navajo, uh, the, the, um, there are more words, you know, and, and there's an interplay of, uh, of, of words and sounds. Uh, so at first I was going after that, uh, you know, and then at the end I that, uh, you know, they, they, these are songs, uh, you know, what do I do uh, with that? And uh, I could not go back, you know, and force them into a Navajo music, which I was not capable of singing. But I said, well, uh, English has, uh, and has been, uh, sorry, Navajo has been translated into English here. That's, you know, that's already a big change. Uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, the sounds, uh, uh, you know, Navajo in one instance, uh, have been changed into, uh, you know, English uh, uh, sounds. I, I, I write about all of this. Um, so I'll, I will translate the music, you know, and so the, the music at the end is also translated, uh, you know, or as um, great uh, uh, Brazilian poet uh, Haroldo de Campos uh, you know, calls it um, transcreation, you know, or I speak of it as othering. Um, I was recently informed, in fact, that I, I don't know if you know the, uh, the word transcreation from, uh, uh, it's always Haroldo's word. Uh, I'm told that recently it has been brought into the world of business and advertising in the same way that deconstruction managed to get, to get <laughs> over there. Uh, you know, so uh, now if, uh, you know, if you're doing translations of ads,
for use in another country, uh, the idea is not simply to translate them, but to transcreate them, uh, you know, so that they will have, you know, some kick, some uh, re you know, real effect in the other country. But they use the term, apparently they're starting to use the term transcreation. So that's interesting. <laughs> total translation, they say. <laughs> Pretty soon, you know, total translation of, you know, Ethnopoetics. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, right. I, uh, well, uh, yeah, in a way, it's, it's, it, in a certain sense, it's not unrelated. <laughs> um, well, oh. Oh. Um, I just wonder if you could uh, say a few words about um, Lorca's deep image that you identify with Lorca variations and uh, the relationship between like deep image and do I day, um, I'm just particularly interested in it. Oh, uh, I think w when Robert Kelly and, and I and others uh, were talking about the, you know, deep image, uh, you know, Lorca figured very largely uh, in, into that. Uh, but uh, we were off in pursuit of something and, and I don't think we you know, made very clear what we were pursuing because we were not that clear about it. Um, but, you know, the, the image had uh, played large in, uh, in American poetry going back uh, to the imagists, uh, you know, Pound and Amy Lowell and, you know, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, we thought, you know, a, 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 a deep image in some, um, you know, psychological sense, whether Freudian or Jungian or uh, and, uh, and and tying into uh, um, you know a whole uh, uh, past of, uh, of, of of poetry. Uh, Lorca uh, on on the folk side uh, comes out of a tradition called uh, cante hundo, hundo, or deep song. Uh, when I'm translated, when deep image is translated into Spanish, my preference is for it to be imagen hondo, uh, not profundo. Uh, you know, profundo makes too much, it's not, not the right claim, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, it's a deep image as, uh, uh, you know, the great gypsy singers had the, the deep song and uh, Lorca goes after it. Uh, the deep song, and in that sense, if you go after the deep song, you're also going after the uh, the, the deep image. Uh, uh, what we tended to leave out, uh, but only temporarily from the uh, the discussion, was the uh, uh, the sound, the song quality. Uh, you know, some people are just putting all the emphasis on you know on on image. You know, of course, you know we're poets. <laughs> we're racked to a fault by uh, you know the way things sound. Well, yeah. Can you say more about um, the first person voice? You talked a little bit about, of course, your new book, I Have Witness, but I'm um, thinking about, you mentioned acting as witness versus not just convention, inventing, reinventing um, the identity of the I. I mean, mm. looking at this whole volume of work, what does that look for you both as a writer, but also when you think about transaction, how to translate the I? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> of, course, of course, it's the pun in I of, of the course. I of witness. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, some of you know Zukowski had a little book called Eyes, pronounced Eyes. I'm trying to remember which E Y E S pronounced I apostrophe S. Uh, um, and after eyes. Oh, and after eyes, right. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there were discussions, you know, about uh, the nature of the first person. Uh, in poetry, <clears throat> and uh, poetry had, had to been reduced to, uh, you know, <clears throat> the the lyric was taken as first person poetry, you know, and a type of <coughs> uh, poetry written from the fifties, probably into the present, uh, was uh, labeled, I think, by a critic named M. L. Rosenthal. Uh, you know, as confessional poetry, you know, and that caught on uh, quite a bit. You know, and others like uh, Olson, where I quote him, you know, you know, challenge, uh, you know, the, 
the, you know, the domination of, uh, of I uh, in, uh, in, in, in poetry. So, you know, I gave thought uh, to that. Uh, but then I, you know, I wondered, you know, how, how do we, you know, what, you know, how do we speak in poetry with, uh, with that first person pronoun? And uh, uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I, th I think I've said this a few times. Uh, I was um, uh, read, looking at reading uh, a, a, a series of uh, visual pieces uh, with words uh, by the artist Jenny Holzer. Uh, you know, and, and it's called Laments. It's like a kind of Spoon River anthology. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, oh, I, you know, I like, I, I hear those as different voices. You know, they all say I, but I hear them as, you know, as different voices. So I, I began to, um, uh, you know, to explore, you know, using the I on my own, uh, quoting you know, particularly from you know, poets who were contemporaries of mine, and, uh, you know, putting some of that in, uh, you know, of course, practicing fiction. You know, not just truth, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, but fiction, you know, also a you know, powerful instrument that poets should not divorce themselves from. For, you know, lying is as powerful as telling the truth. Uh, you know, and m maybe the fancy is uh, is also the domain of the lie. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so poets should be, you know, you know, lie lie bravely as Luther told people, sin bravely. <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I think it, it, it varies on that. I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of instances of, uh, of, of writing. Uh, the, um, I mean, the inst what comes immediately to mind in terms of, uh, you know, being sort of struck, you know, and an, an outpouring of writing following from that uh, was uh, <clears throat> following a, um, a visit to, to Poland in uh, uh, the late 80s. Uh, and uh, I, I had written Poland 1931, uh, 20 years before, and never s had set foot in Poland. Uh, so my wife and I and our son, uh, he, he was living in Hamburg at the time, and we looked at the map. We, we could go over to visit in Poland. It's not far away. This is the, you know. So we went to uh, to Poland, and. Uh, I was, I, you know, because for me, so it was also a, uh, a place from, you know, from which my parents and, you know, others had come, uh, you know, but also it was, uh, you know, the, the place of uh, destruction of Holocaust. Uh, and, you know, I, I felt that very strongly, uh, just sitting, you know, just entering into the place, you know, and then finally a, um, a culminating uh, visit, uh, 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 to, uh, to Auschwitz, uh, we had we already been to Treblinka, uh, where, uh, as far as I know, most of my family had been murdered. But uh, uh, anyway, in, in that vi visit, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, began, sort of felt myself pushed into uh, uh, in, 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 into writing. Uh, other times, uh, uh, you know, with. Um, the variations, you know, I, there's a procedure. Uh, you know, I s start with Lorca's poems or my poems or Octavio Paz's poems or, uh, you know, I've, you know, done it with a, uh, you know, and, and I follow that, uh, you know, th that procedure. And uh, sometimes I'm hot and sometimes I'm cold. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, so that's uh, uh, different. Um, uh, some poems I write in a hurry, and uh, some poems I start and drop and come back to. So, uh, uh, 
And I never, I never feel myself as being very prolific, you know. But uh, you know, but I've had, you know, the, 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 the fortune of, uh, you know, of a lot of years to, uh, you know, to accumulate a body of work, uh, you know. So if uh, you do that, even if, uh, even if the stuff doesn't come, you know, that uh, that fast. Uh, Robert Kelly, who was a uh, close associate, you know, back many years. Uh, uh, now there was, is, you know, an amazingly, you know, prolific uh, man. Uh, he, he was, you know, quite young, was already accumulating a, you know, a body of manuscripts, that, you know, that was stacked in folders, you know, and. Uh, you come in, you'd see these uh, actually black binders. We used to use black <laughs> binders. You, you come in, you'd see this row of black binders in you know in, in Kelly's apartment. You know, and, uh, Rob said that that's uh, <laughs> this uh, been written since January. <laughs> 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 yeah, so he was you know, but very good, very good. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, so we, 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 we always in terms of being prolific, you have to put yourself up against Kelly. <laughs> Did, didn't work. <laughs> um, on this topic of historic incident, sort of discarding, I was wondering if you had uh, any sort of practices in, in disciplines that have either you began with or started in the years in a way of uh, combating the tendency that. Myself, yeah. Finding myself which is to just uh, sort of childishly claim that um, what I'm what I'm looking for will just sort of come at some 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 later date and in that sense perpetuating the cycle of never finishing things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, you know, there are <coughs> there are times when I'm doing less writing. Uh, uh, tr translation, I find, is. Uh, <coughs> Um, let's say at uh, you know at otherwise slack times, uh, you know one can always turn to you know to translation, transcreation, othering, uh, you know so that uh, um, you don't have to. You can be very premeditated about uh, you know about what you're doing in that uh, in that case. So I liked uh, translations. Kept me writing even when I wasn't otherwise writing. Um, you know, the, the business of discarding poems and then coming, ba you know, back to them. If uh, you know, if you keep scraps, copies, notebooks, uh, you know, or uh, uh, something else that I mentioned briefly uh, last night was. Um, when um, even if we're not that prolific, you know, we write more than can be put into any one book at any one time. Uh, so uh, it's also a question of leaving something out. Uh, uh, you know, so my first book was a little book of uh, you know maybe 68 pages called uh, White Sun, Black Sun, and uh, you know I had written. You know more poems than what was in that book, you know, but um, uh, was uh, in effect self-published. Uh, I, I was doing it with David Anton, a uh, uh, publishing company called uh, Hawkswell Press, and uh, so it, you know it was reduced to that. Then l later on, I found some of the poems that I had not included, and. Uh, I couldn't understand why had I not included those. <laughs> you know, they seem to me better than you know, most of the poems that were in the book. But uh, I'm, you know, able to give myself a, a, a lot of time for writing. And you know, my experience is, you know, sooner or later it happens. Yeah, sure. 
right by saying how impressed I am by how much you've managed to read. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I guess I wondered about that particular conception of a poem as a kind of concentrated, uh, like sort of nucleic energy around which an entire assemblage of your reading practices or a particular assemblage of your um, of, of, of poetic history really uh, circulates. If you, what poets you felt a particular kindred relationship to in that conception of a poem's relationship to a large body of poetic history? Um, well, I, I quoted uh, <coughs> you know, uh, Robert Duncan, yeah. uh, who's a good friend, uh, <coughs> speaking about, um, is, is that an actual time? Yeah, I think this is probably not our last question. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> okay, no, no, no. You know, Duncan speaking about uh, uh, grand collage uh, and uh, 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 poem is a, a, po a poem of all poems. Uh, and uh, someplace or another, I, th I, th I think when Poems of a Millennium first came out, uh, Pierre Joris and I were being interviewed, uh, you know, and uh, they said, you know, what's the next anthology going to be? And I said, well, maybe an anthology of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, we could keep pushing along, but not, now I'm <laughs> concerned about getting, getting to the plane on time. <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you. Thank you.